once around the Helix Nebula. So the Helix Nebula is fairly low in the sky from my location here in Cambridge in the UK. It's in the southerly part of the constellation of Aquarius with a declination of negative 20, so 20 degrees below the celestial equator, which means that from my point of view it only makes it to about 8 degrees above the horizon, um, just above the hedge at the bottom of my uh, observing site, so somewhat difficult, only get a few days each year when I can actually point the telescope at this, but I have done and I've got some nice photographs. The Helix Nebula, catalogued as NGC, New General Catalogue, 7239, and uh, you can see the location there marked with the red numbers. Discovered by this guy, Carl Ludwig Harding, and it says most likely before 1824, because the records are a little bit incomplete, but I uh, absolutely love the photographs of this uh, that people have generated through various instruments uh, and they're all different. Everybody has a different idea of how to interpret the color palette. Um, so there's quite a nice amateur grade one for you. Here's a professional image showing the Helix Nebula in much more detail. And this is a planetary nebula, nothing to do with planets. This is a dying star, a sun-like star has ejected most of its outer atmosphere and left just the central hot white dwarf star, that little pinprick of light right in the center there. And you can see how the material changes color. It's bluish in the center yellower in the mid part and then fades away to red and then dark red at the outside and that's telling us things about the uh, way it's being illuminated by the light from the central star which is a very very hot white dwarf star so a lot of very high energy light a lot of blue but it's also telling us about the chemical composition and the uh, pinkish red color around the outside is a mixture of a lot of dirt and dust plus uh, large amounts of hydrogen giving us that red color and the yellow that is from helium unburnt helium that was uh, ejected later on so the outer layers were unburnt hydrogen then helium from deeper in and in the center then the mix would have been dominated by carbon and oxygen which tend to give us some of those bluer tinges as well distance wise somewhere in the 650 to 700 light years depending on which source you look at uh, the most recent is Gaia saying 655 so at the nearer end of that and it does put it as one of the nearest planetary nebulae to the earth um, and that's why it's so spectacular from our point of view we see it as a ring around the central star it's actually more of a prolate spheroid a rugby ball shape or American football shape object and um, that's uh, around about uh, just under three light years in diameter along the long axis tilted at our line of sight by 20 to 40 degrees and that uh, gives it the flattened shape when we're looking at it one side of the disc is definitely more compressed than the other side probably because the material is impacting a denser region of the interstellar clouds between the stars and being slowed down in its expansion and the image in the center there is an infrared image and that just goes to show that uh, depending on what wavelength you look at these objects with you can represent the colors any way you like and you can get more detail by choosing the color palette to bring out anything that you're looking for so the European Space Agency provided this lovely map overlaid on the image of the Helix Nebula showing the different features that have been identified. So we've got the white dwarf right in the middle, we've got the inner disk region that you can see highlighted, then the outer ring and then we've got the southeast and northwest plumes um, and then further out various shock waves and arcs 
and the asymmetry of it is particularly visible there in that it's uh, much compressed up towards the northeast so that's where the material is definitely pushing up against and meeting some resistance from a dense part of the uh, interstellar medium whereas down to the lower right on the west side it's more free to expand so this material the temperature it's about 1800 Kelvin in the central region so not quite hot enough to glow as a black body radiation um, effect into the visible spectrum at all but certainly very bright in the infrared and this is an image from the Spitzer Space Telescope and then further out the temperature obviously drops away as you get further from the white dwarf star down to around 900 Kelvin in the outer regions so glowing into the uh, lower regions of the infrared there you can already see there's a lot of detail in these images and I absolutely love this one. This is again from Spitzer, infrared image. So we're picking up the infrared uh, light from the central star. We're seeing a red glow from around it, which is a dust disk. And then further out, highlighted in the uh, turquoise blue color, you can see all of this material and if you look at it you can see streamers that seem to be pointing inwards that look like comets these cometary knots as they've been described and uh, there are just an incredible number of these um, we have some fantastic images of them this is from the Subaru telescope and what you can see is that these are little dense globules with tails on them as many as 40,000 someone's actually attempted to count them I, I think that's uh, going to be not really a sport I would get involved in but uh, there's a lot of these anyway and the telescopes we have today are phenomenal they can zoom right in and we have another image here a real close-up of these cometary knots now these are probably Raleigh Taylor instability it's the effect of different densities. It's just like a lava lamp, in fact. Uh, if you have, remember uh, what happens with a lava lamp, you have a heat source at the bottom and two immiscible liquids, and you, you get these uh, fingers of material that rise up, cool, and then fall back down again as they uh, circulate round, and they create these sorts of cometary knots inside your lava lamp. Uh, you, you get the exact same effect wherever there are two immiscible fluids and a heat source. And of course the heat source, they're all pointing towards it, they're all pointing towards the central white dwarf star. And then the uh, tails lead back in the shadow of the dense blobs. So how old is this uh, helix nebula then? Well, it's pretty young actually in terms of being a nebula. The inner disk was only ejected just over 6,500 years ago and it's expanding. We can measure the Doppler shift and you can see that it's expanding at 40 kilometers per second, so twice as fast as the Earth goes around the Sun. And the, the outer layers date back twice as far, 12,100 years, and are expanding more slowly at only 32. So, of course, what's happening is the inner layers are catching up with and overtaking the slower moving outer layers. And it's that that's creating those Raleigh Taylor instabilities as the hot younger material is trying to overtake the cooler, slower moving outer layers, creating all of those uh, cometary knots. And this tells us really that the outer material probably wasn't ejected in the same process. The inner material was ejected as the star finally transformed itself into a white dwarf and blew the last remaining parts of its atmosphere away. But the outer material was ejected much earlier, no, 6,000 years earlier, during the last phases of the star's life as an AGB star, an asymptotic giant branch star, which is like an advanced stage of a red giant. 
uh, where it's gone through the ordinary red giant phase, ignited helium, burning to form carbon and oxygen in the core, and then the uh, carbon-oxygen core has started to build up, so it's ended up with hydrogen burning in a shell, overlaying a helium-burning shell, overlaying a dead, inert carbon-oxygen core. And when that happens, the as the processes go through, it tends to kick off the outer layers while the star is still burning. And that's why we have those outer shells. The central star itself, a white dwarf, magnitude 13.5. So you can pick that up with uh, amateur astrophotography equipment these days. And uh, this is tiny only 2.5% the size of Sol, our Sun, 17,000 kilometers across, so smaller than the Earth, but weighs in at 68% uh, the mass of our Sun. So an awful lot of material has been ejected from this star. It was considerably more massive than our Sun is today when it was uh, fully alive and burning, but only 68% has remained in that inner core, the rest having been ejected in the multiple rounds of uh, the nebula formation. Now these white dwarf stars are always uh, classified D. Uh, they are class D from their spectrum, um, and this one is specifically DAO, which tells us about the temperature and the composition of it. And it is very hot indeed. Temperature 120,000 Kelvin. Our sun is just 6,000. So this is 20 times hotter. And it's that that gives it that blue color. And there is an enormous amount of very strong ultraviolet light coming away as well as would be beginning to emit soft x-rays at this sort of temperature as well. Now we saw around it in the infrared image a pale red uh, smudge around the central star and that is a disk of material around about uh, going from 30 to 100 astronomical units so that's the orbit of Neptune uh, at 30 astronomical units out to beyond where our Kuiper belt uh, would be with all those icy bodies and indeed this seems to be made of icy bodies as well lots of dust picking up the infrared light perhaps fragments of dust that have resulted from the collisions of a lot of these small icy worlds that seem to be still in orbit around the white dwarf and thousands of what we call exocomets and so these are again dirty snowballs of material that have ended up in this region and are being strongly illuminated by the very high energy beams coming from the White Dwarf itself, um, perhaps pointing to the fact that there is sort of not only a Kuiper belt, but a an Oort cloud-like structure around the star. Now in 2024, periodic variations in the star's output seem to suggest that there was a planet around about 2.3 times the uh, Earth's mass, so a super Earth going around the uh, star itself, and I don't have a photograph of that. Um, what's in this artist's impression looks an awful lot like the moon to me, um, but uh, it's uh, a good representation of a, a rocky body that seems to be in a, a fixed orbit around the white dwarf, showing that the planets, or at least the cores of the planets, seem to be able to survive the ejection of the nebula. And in 2025, X-ray uh, studies by the Chandra Space Telescope revealed that there are such material going into the White Dwarf uh, as to suggest that it's the stripping of a Jupiter-sized object, like a, a large gas giant planet orbiting close into the White Dwarf and beginning to be torn apart into that disk, adding material into it that will uh, spiral in and get superheated, soft x-rays coming off, 
Um, and so there is, again, a survivor, uh, although I don't think this one's going to survive very long at the rate that we seem to think that uh, the material is being dragged away from it. And so here's that lovely multi-wavelength image of the Helix Nebula with the uh, extreme outer layers all beginning to show there and that dust disk in the pink reddish region in the middle with the white dwarf. This is uh, infrared with added visible and ultraviolet light overlaid on top of it giving us this false color but nevertheless fantastic view. Um, and with that I will leave you with the final picture here of the Helix Nebula um, and it's such a beautiful object if you do get a chance to find this and uh, if you live further south than I do you've got more chance as I say I only get about two days a year when this is above the hedge and observable from my location due to that negative 20 of the uh, declination in the constellation of Aquarius makes it somewhat tricky from my point of view but from the southern hemisphere definitely much easier to observe it'll be much higher up and uh, should be uh, truly spectacular so that's it thanks very much for listening